Hey everybody, welcome to Beyond. Be sure to hit like and subscribe so people can find the channel. And today we would like to welcome Berke Brown. Berke, welcome. Hello, good to see you, Ben. Glad to be here. Good to see you too, man. It's been a while and it's good to uh, reconnect after a couple weeks in our uh, journey and uh, Roadmaps to Resilience. All right. So today I want to talk about the uh, six laws of power. And when we think about successful people and what makes people successful, there's some, there's some patterns, there's some traits that they tend to exhibit. And there's some work they've done over time to get to that level. It's not like they fall off the, the log and all of a sudden they came into a lot of money, but they're very intentional. They're very disciplined. And they right. really approach people and circumstances in very uh, discreet, specific ways. And so the first law of power that I wanted to share was um, the idea of concealing your intentions. Like I mentioned earlier, we were uh, sort of talking in the front end of our conversation that if you're starting a company, a medical device company, for example, and you have an idea, the first thing you want to do with that idea is you want to patent it or you want to protect it. Because once you get out there in the public domain, if it's not patented or protected, someone else could take it and, and, and run with it. So the same idea of, of concealing your intentions that you, you, with the successful people I've found, they kind of keep you off balance, right? In, in the dark, they don't reveal their true intentions or plans by design. And by not knowing your plan, they can prepare for defense. And what do I mean by that? Because in business and sometimes in life, you can have this incredible idea or you can have a plan that you're going to sort of implement. And if you tell everybody about it, people are competitive and they're going to come at it at a different angle, a different strategy, just like chess. And so very successful people tend to uh, conceal their intentions. And, and it's sometimes for nefarious reasons because they want to win, right? They want to win in business. Right. Um, so anyways, I'm just curious, Berkey, in your experience uh, and your mm -hmm. research, what have you seen along these lines? Yeah, you know what? This is actually from uh, Think and Grow Rich. It says, tell the world what you're going to do, but do it first. Uh, and I love that idea. It's, it's, it, there's kind of multiple reasons that you would kind of keep things close to the chest. One, of course, to protect uh, the, the IP that you have, your intellectual property. And, and the other is because you're afraid uh, that, that somebody will snake the idea. And it kind of ties back to it. It's, there's the fear. There's also just like, I need to be uh, planning out what, I, what I'm doing and do it in a way that I can make sure that I'm the one who's successful at this. But I think that what's interesting about tell the world what you're going to do, but do it first is if you are really focused on what you're doing by nature, you're actually going to spend less time communicating with people unless they're tied to the vision that you're trying to create, right? So it's not so much that you have to just be like, oh, I'm not going to tell anybody about this, but it's more so I'm so focused on what I'm doing that I'm only going to pull into my circle people that have the same impetus to create what I'm trying to create. And so it kind of seems like a silence. That's when you're so focused on what you're doing. Now, there's also a, a great uh, verse from the Tao. It says, "Who he who speaks does not know. He who does not speak knows. And then it says, mask your brightness, temper your sharpness. And ultimately, when I, what I kind of glean from that is sometimes it's better to be quiet. The wise person stays silent because they gather information. A speaking person cannot learn, right? And at the same time, when it says mask your brightness, all of a sudden that puts you in a place where it's like, oh, I thought I'm supposed to shine my light to the world. Sometimes you have to know when to shine and when to turn off. Temper your sharpness. Sometimes you don't need to cut. Sometimes be blunt. Sometimes be dull. There's surgical times and there's also just blunt object times. And sometimes you just not to, don't need to be there. So I think what's really good about people who work in silence, hustle in silence, you're not concerned with the energies and opinions and thoughts and suggestions of naysayers. It's just this ability to focus on what's important to you. Now, when you use it as a strategy, like you said, kind of a more nefarious where you're trying to uh, keep people on their toes and make sure that they never really stumble upon what you're really doing. I get that. I think that that can work. I think that that's a fear-based action and a fear-based movement. But I think if you're so focused on your work that you're not talking, that's because you're clear on your goal. And then so it may get people to be off kilter, not know what's going on. You'll look mysterious, but that's not your intention. For me, the most important thing is what's your intention. If you're silent because you're hustling and you're focused, that's a beautiful intention for success. But if your goal is just to keep people off their game, that means that your success is preventing another person from doing something versus you producing something. Yeah, that's a good point. And to sort of give you a, a countering sort of perspective that um, the idea of guiding someone down the wrong path, because by the time they figure it out, it'll be too late. What I mean by that is I was in a business scenario where we had founded this startup. We raised about 23 million in the C round. We were about to close on 30 million in the D round. And in the C round, we had a corporate entity come under the guise of a corporate investment. And in reality, they brought a patent attorney to basically lift the idea. So by the time we went to the D round, 
about a month before we we're going to close, all of a sudden the patent surfaced and all the investors in the D round, which we had 30 million committed, went poof, went bye-bye. Wow. And so the lesson there is we kind of opened up, lifted up the Komodo. We had what we thought was trust. And the reality was there was sort of nefarious aims with this company. Why? Because their existing business that we're going to disrupt represented about an 800 million a year opportunity for them. So they were looking to kill us before we got to market. And so sometimes, mm. you know, strategically and tactically, you have to be thoughtful about what you, what you show, what you conceal and when you show it. And ideally in a medical device, I'll take this as an example. Once you have IP, which we did have, um, and once you have market share, you have a little more leverage, you de-risk the opportunity and you have more leverage as to negotiating power with a given, in this case, strategic big company. So I think there's times where Absolutely. you have to conceal in a business sense because you know every business is competitive, right? And everybody, if you look at Tesla and what they're doing, there's so many people trying to figure out his recipe for success. And why is he so successful? Because they want some of that, that opportunity. And by the way, Elon would say, look, if you look at the car market, I think he said Tesla is going to be about, if we got 1% of the market share, that'd be astronomical. It's so huge, right? So, you know, there's a big, there's, there's a big piece of the pie that people could grow into from electric car standpoint, right. but you can bet dollars to donuts that there's people trying to figure out the strategy and how to usurp Elon Musk, how to take, 100%. get an advantage because this market's hot. So from that perspective, I think concealing your intentions on a business side uh, can be very useful. It reminds me of art of war, you know, uh, keep your friends close, but your enemies closer. And I agree 100%. There's a time to be shrewd. There's a time to be highly competent and conscious of what's happening around you. I have NDAs, you know what I mean? To be able to be at that place where you understand that it's not the time. Even I feel like Jesus kept his, his powers like silent for a little bit. Before he did the, the water to wine, he's like, it's not my time. He was waiting for the moment to do what he did to make the impact that he wants. And so I think it's definitely, uh, it's true that there are some times where shrewdness is extremely important, where you need to be quiet. You need to be under the radar. You need to kind of have that ninja movement in order to strike when the iron's hot, when no, nobody expects it. That's what it becomes the overnight success, even though it's been a decade and a half in, in the making, you know? That's <laughs> so true. No, it's right. so true. And you know, you let into the second law of power, which is really always say less than is necessary. And I like that idea of Jesus Christ example you gave because mm. he was very shrewd, shrewd. He was very strategic and he was very deliberate about his words. And so mm -hmm. the idea, the more we say, the more common you'll appear and the more less control you'll seem, right? So you've met those people in business where they're just chatty caddies and what are they trying to do? They're trying to make an impression. They're trying to impress you with what they know and how, how I mean, maybe how they've grown in their career or how they're going to impact a certain project. But I would say it will appear original if you keep vague and open-ended your ideas. Vagueness is, there's power in vagueness. And I think powerful people use it all the time and, and power people impress and intimidate by saying less. So less yep. is more. I, so again, these are strategies that people use in power to project power, uh, to get people's attention, like you said, with Jesus Christ, because he would say less, but boy, when he acted, when he did speak, people would listen. 100%. Uh, silence is, you know, when you listen to music, right, there's, there's notes, you have quarter notes, half notes, whole notes, all the different stuff, but then there's the rests, right? These little symbols that mean pause. That's a part of the music. That's a note in itself. And the silence really is what, in a lot of ways, is the background for the next sound to come. Because there's a moment before the, before the climax of the music comes, and you're just there, and then the pause, and then it gives the relief. And in the same way, when you, when you talk, even when you listen to incredible orators, they're not fast speakers. They understand the power of the pause, because everybody leans in. And so in a lot of ways, I think it's true, man, that vagueness, that mysteriousness, that ability to speak in, in, um, in parable or analogy or metaphor, what it does is it puts people in this kind of hypnotic cadence where they're like, I want to know more from this person. I want to hear from this person, right? And it really is a, a method of power because you're not exerting or forcing. And it goes back to this quote of mine, the man who has nothing to prove proves everything already. So if I don't have to prove that I'm the smartest person in the room, all of a sudden people are wondering what I'm about. It's a powerful thing and it's very real and it's utilized in business and relationships. It's utilized everywhere uh, if utilized correctly. Yeah, that's a good point. Cause you know, the more you say, the more potential sounding foolish, right? The more you right. utter, uh, you're right, trying right. to speak into something that you're way over your ski tips on. You have no real idea, but you're trying <laughs> to sound yeah, yeah, smart yeah. and you end up, people right. start talking, you start hearing the chatter and it, it, it's really impactful. I would argue to uh, your reputation and how, how you're coming across to people. Right. No, 100%. I agree. It's, it's just having that, that control. Only say what you need to say. If there's anything else, 
uh, the question is, why, what are you trying to prove? Just say your part, do what you came to do, and then out. Yeah, only do what you need, only say what you need to say. Otherwise, go get therapy, right? Because there's something right, exactly. You need, exactly. Like you you need, need to babble if you need to. <laughs> <laughs> right, right, right. Uh, so anyway, that's that's so true. And you know, so the the third power I, I came across, law of power, was so much depends on your reputation. Guard with your life, and this is really important, I think. And today's social media age, when you see what people are posting, I remember I just came back from Cabo and. I got to tell you, people, people are taking pictures. We're in this pool and this girl right. went crazy on the alcohol um, and she ended up getting out of the pool so inebriated that she started running to catch her balance and headlong into a pole. And guess what oh. people were doing? They're just taking pictures. And that's just one example that wow. people's reputations live or die on an image. People make a snap judgment on a person right. and you'll see people on their social media. Maybe they're posting pictures with drinks or whatever they've done and all you have to go on as an employer in the future is, you're, and you know you're going to check your social media, right? Is right. what am I seeing? What kind of image are you projecting out there? And I would argue that reputation is the cornerstone of power, right? Reputation alone can intimidate and win, but once mm -hmm. it slips over, you are vulnerable and will, you know, you'll be attacked by all sides. So, and again, reputation is used all the time. If you if you are a CEO of a Fortune 500 with this incredible track record. You walk into a room, and in fact, I was talking to a CEO early this morning. I said, how does a CEO balance the energy they bring, their expertise they bring, the intimidation they bring? How do they balance that with getting people to open up on the team? Right? Right. So there is, right. there is a, a lot of this power <laughs> that you got a reputation, man. You got to protect it because that's currency in business. It's, it's social capital, man. And that's, that's one of the biggest things that uh, we're human. So we need to interconnect. We need to feel safe around people. We need to feel that we can trust people. We need to see that what a leader looks like, uh, if they can be decisive. There's so many things and attributes that are, that are important to being a person of a strong reputation. And so if you're not in control of your story, if you're not in control of your narrative, then other people will write your narrative. 100%. I mean, if you look at Steve Jobs, Steve Jobs narrative, most for most people that worked under him is like, he's a tyrant, right? But he right. was so clear on his message. And he was so clear on what he was trying to create that people were willing to even overlook that I'm not saying that it was at a healthy level. But it definitely produced what happened was because he had this, this kind of innovative reputation of this di reality distortion field that people said, when you were around him, you believed things you wouldn't have believed if you weren't around him. You right. would believe something is possible that you would have thought impossible, impossible otherwise. So what happens is when you can build a reputation, people fall in line. And that's how you become a leader. When you build a brand of sureness, of clarity, of willingness to be wrong, but when you know you're right, you're 100% you're on, that gives people trust. And people follow people that they trust, that they believe, right? Even if they're imperfect. And yeah. I think in a lot of ways, if you're not protecting your narrative, if you're not protecting your brand, your brand identity, uh, then what happens is people will write it for you. And so if you want to maintain some sense of power, and to me, power is influence, power is resources. If I want to maintain power, and why is it important for me to have power? It's because I trust the direction that I'm going. I trust what I'm creating. And I want others to join in on it because I know that it will create beauty in their lives. So because I have that, I have this almost, not arrogance, but this clarity that pushes me forward. And so it's important for me to uphold my reputation not in a way where I'm uh, uh, looking different than I really am, but my reputation of this is who I am, I'm confident in this thing, and I'm going to move forward, follow me if you want to. That's that space that you wanna create, but you have to understand that you have to keep alignment on that reputation. So anybody who looks from any different angle sees the same person. That means that you're solid in your brand. Right, and that's so powerful. You know, The idea of authenticity and then perspective and, and vision and, and who you are and knowing who you are is so critical. And you sort of dovetailing off what you said about Steve Jobs, I'd say, make your reputation unassailable. Always be alert for potential attack because they will attack you. And let's go back to Absolutely. Steve Jobs when he was at Apple 1.0. He actually founded this company, built it to a certain level of success, and eventually the board got rid of him. I mean, think about that. And then he right. came back even stronger, even more purposeful, right? He understood the value of reputation because he went through it, I mean, we, we, you could argue, a pretty major dinger from a career standpoint. He found right, it absolutely. next, he found a few other opportunities, but he came back to Apple, I would say really emboldened, very clear on what needed right. to happen. But part of that was a reputation. Could you imagine founding a company that was world renowned and then they bounce you? 
just to ask you to come back a few years later? I mean, right. emotionally, what that would be like? I, I can't imagine. That's and it's genius because it, it also builds their reputation. Is that added to the story? That devastation, you know, for some person would be like, I had it all, and they'd just kind of be like Al Bundy looking about his high school years when he was a great person, great uh, football player. But then he's like, No, I'm going to create next, and then I'm going to make the company that fired me, my own company, from my own company, buy and then take me back. Like this is that's how you build that solid reputation. And really, in a lot of ways, no matter how much you talk about who you are, your actions and your story. Uh, is what's going to determine that reputation. And that's why it's so important. Like you said, the images match the, the experience that people have in front of you. And it also match this overarching narrative of who you are through time. That's a great point. And you know, that, that's when I really haven't considered that angle, but the idea of adding to his story and adding to his, his allure, his reputation in, in the story of a, a Silicon icon, if you will, Silicon Valley icon, mm -hmm. uh, it certainly did that in space. But I'd also argue probably in the moment, it didn't feel very good. But it, it totally changed his management philosophy and how he sort of approached right. things. So um, the, 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 the fourth law of power that I came across was create an air of mystery. And I've met a lot of CEOs, and you sometimes feel like you can't pierce that veil. They give you a little bit of information, but there's so much more depth there. And you, you see it in, in subsequent meetings or encounters when they get up in front of people. You recognize they've given you maybe 5% uh, maybe of what they know. And I've seen this throughout my career, and that's also part of how people maintain their power and position, right? Um, but I think what they do as a strategy is they create that air of mystery and they never make it clear uh, about what, you know, what you are, what you're about in a sense, right? You're, you're just, right. you kind of keep it vague, right? And you never show the cards, right? And mystery uncertainty, what create what? Anticipation. So if I'm mysterious and it's kind of uncertainty, you get people's attention. And when you get people's attention, you have the ability to really push your vision, right? Because it mm. adds more to, your, you know, to the allure of who you are, the uniqueness, you're not just the average, you know, person. Um, and so I think this idea of mystery can really add to your, your sort of your power base, if you will. Yeah, 100%. I think, um, you know, it's just like a preview for a movie. If you kind of yeah. look, society, marketing has, has already discovered everything about human psychology, to be honest. I mean, that's, that's the one thing that's beneficial and dangerous in a capitalistic society is they will spend every dollar on how to get you to behave or do something that they want. How do you turn a nation into a nation of consumers? Well, you have to give a set some type of insecurity and you have to set some type of benefit with the product that you serve. And if you can increase the insecurity and or increase the value, perceived value of the product, bada bing, bada bang, bada boom, you got it all put together. So I feel in a lot of ways, as you look at like, for example, previews for movies, they give you enough of a taster, but not enough to understand exactly what's going on. We were just talking about Tenet. I'm like, okay, I don't get it with the premise of what it's talking about. And whether it's a good movie or a bad movie, I'm intrigued in watching it because I just want to at least get what the concept is. So the same thing with us as individuals is if we can put ourselves into a place where we don't kind of give all the goods, we just express what needs to be expressed. We don't need to be seen in the spotlight. When you put yourself in that position, you automatically gain an air of mystery. Plus, if you're a leader, just in natural form, if I'm a leader, I already am doing things that followers wouldn't do. Does that make sense? Like if right. I'm leading, then I've, I've somehow moved or shuffled myself ahead of where the followers are. Whatever that disparity is, that difference is, is the mystery. Because if they were to understand the mystery and apply it, they would be leaders too. So just by nature of me being a leader or anybody else being a leader, there is the mystery of the, of the space between where they stand. And so ultimately, if you are a leader, you don't have to try to be mysterious. If you are uh, a manager of some sort, if you are someone who creates or has gone the, a further distance than most other people, just by nature, your existence creates a mystery because it's the chasm between what they're not willing to do and what you're willing to do. So true. And I like that movie analogy because really everyone will, know, will want to know what comes next, right? If you create the mystery right. and there's uncertainty, like what's the next chapter? What's the next sequel? Or what's this movie about, right? And I think movie, movie directors and when they promote movies, they use uh, mystery to beguile, to seduce, to frighten people, right? Um, as do a lot of leaders, right? They use all kinds of te techniques and levers. I think sometimes... When people see CEOs, they just presume they worked hard, they had some good breaks, and they're generally, you know, intelligent and bright. But I would argue mm -hmm. there's so much more layer, there's so many more layers to being a CEO or a leader or a manager or a director, a general, fill in the blank, um, mm -hmm. in terms of personal interaction and how they're reading people. Almost like a psychologist, you sort of like a chess match. You you say certain things and they have a foreknowing and a foreshadowing 
of what those words and how they'll impact an organization or a group of people that go beyond the obvious, right? Because I think a lot of people just look at it like, well, you said X and we're going to go do Y now, right? But it's it's so much more subtle at some levels, um, but so much more art involved at other levels. Absolutely, man. It's it's very, very nuanced. Um, and it's kind of, uh, you know, uh, there's this give and take too as, as, as a person who's in a leadership role to be what the people that are following or the employees are not, to be that thing that's willing to take the responsibility if it's successful and if it fails, right? There's that. And then also there's this importance of the leader to express in a language that the followers or the employees understand where they feel that they have a part They have skin in the game on that success that's going to be created. So it's not so much, I'm going to take the mountain and you guys watch. It's, I'm going to take the mountain. I'm going to be the first of the battalion to go up and and, and attack the enemy. But at the same time, you know, you all have your spear, you all have your swords, and we need each other to get to the top. And so it's this ability to be the one that's stepping in the front, be the one that has the vision, be the one that's the leader, but at the same time, communicate that to those that are following you in a way to where they see their value in the uh, success of the entire mission. So, so very important. I mean, that's, that's a very critical, I'd say, business management philosophy. If you're a good manager, mm-hmm. um, it, you know, that, that, that is, you know, oftentimes when people come into positions, they get promoted they'll use the power of the office to get things done, right? And that's one Mm -hmm. way to do it. Um, But I think to make lasting change and lasting impact, you gotta go way beyond that, Um, become authentic, become approachable, become real, um, and really get people involved in a process where they see what's in it for them. Uh, They have the tools they need to be successful. There's always communication back and forth. And this leads me to the last, or the fifth power, uh, law of power, if you will, is win through your actions and never through an argument. You know, it's easy mm-hmm. as, as a leader to try to argue your way into a position or a strategy right. or, um, uh, you know, uh, what a business should or shouldn't be doing. But any right. moment, mo- momentary gain that you achieve through an argument is a temporary victory in, this, in the resentment and ill will that it will create and last longer than any momentary gain or victory, right? So I think if you go into an argument, you offend people, and you're the boss and you use your power to get what you want, right. you may get that short-term victory, but boy, you'll have a lot of ill will and you'll have people like the equivalent of drogue shoots trying to run a 50 or 40 yard dash. They're not going to be very right. fast. Yeah. You know, it goes back to, you know, I was saying that power is about uh, influence and resources. It's not about punishment and reward. It's not about control. Um, I think that's, that's very difficult. Leaders really quickly think that when they have power, they have control, right? And if they can't express that control in other areas of their lives, and they're going to flex it wherever they can, and they'll do it harshly. That's kind of the, the, the unhealthy, perverted version of, of leadership. I don't call that leadership. In fact, um, that's just tyranny. I think ultimately a true leader is a servant. A true leader understands that his job or her job is to serve the people. And I'm not sure if I, if I mentioned this before, but another thing from the Tao, it says, <clears throat> it says, why is the king, why is the sea king of a thousand streams? And it says, because it lies beneath them and all the water pours into it. It says, if you are to lead the people, you are to leave them behind. And it says, because he does not meet competition, uh, because he does not compete, he does not meet competition. So it's these kind of concepts that are so backwards. The, the, the king is below the people. If he is to lead, he must be behind. And if you don't compete, then you won't have competition. And so there's this kind of not needing to do anything but serve the people. So if I have to argue my way to the top, if I have to prove you wrong, it's almost like I say this all the time, it's like me getting out of a pool. In order to get out of a pool, I have to almost push down the thing for me to get up. If I have to push people down, if I have to make you feel less in order for me to feel good, it's just insecurity that's pushing it forward. It is still weakness and it is not leadership in any way, shape or form. The true goal, like you said, is to reason with people. It's to remember, what are we here to do? What is, what is our ultimate vision? What is your perspective of the path to that vision? What is my perspective? What is their perspective? And then we take all that into consideration and we honor all of those things. And if I am the leader at the end of the day, if it's me to make the decision, then I will make the decision and I won't question it. But after I've gathered all that information, I have to honor everybody because all these people are supporting up the vision of what we're trying to achieve. So I think truly as a leader, you go back, you listen, you hear from the ground. You know, when I do my organizational uh, consulting work, we have a culture survey where everybody fills it out from the janitor to the CEO, because we want to get a perspective on what people feel the energy of this place is. 
And once we get that clarity on where people are at, then we put everybody in the pot to be able to gather to decide what are the values? What are we trying to create? Where are we trying to go? And then once that all gets clear, then the leader says, now I know what we're all about, coupled with my own vision, this is the direction that we're gonna go. But you have to be willing to open your ears. Leaders listen, leaders serve, leaders lie beneath. And when the moment to strike is there, they're in the front. When the moment to attack, they're in the front. But when their flock is hurt, they check on them. Right. Then they get back to work. It's, it's that dance, understanding. And I really think that arguing, fighting, being right, you know, I always say it's not about who's right, it's about what's right. All you do is you just look at the vision, you hear the two choices, and you see which one fits with the vision better. I don't care whose choice it is. If this gets me closer to what I'm creating and it's your idea, <laughs> that has nothing to do with me. Right. What I'm trying to get to is everything to do with me, right? No, it's good. You know, and by the way, as we talk about these laws of power, this isn't just for business. This is personal life. This is life. Absolutely. In general, right? And I, I would say that it's way more powerful to get others to agree with you through your actions without saying a word. I mean, if you could just demonstrate who you are as a leader by your actions, you're going to influence and persuade a lot more people to your position than you would trying to force fit a narrative or dialogue them into a position. Now, you could browbeat them with your power, certainly, but as we discussed, it's, it's not very effective. So I'd say demonstrate, do not explicate, right? Demonstrate mm. leadership principles, demonstrate the values of the organization, demonstrate the agenda or the strategy and live it out as a leader. Ooh, you know, it's, that's, that's perfect. Now I, I explicate, demonstrate. What I like about that is, you know, when we do the values work with the organizations, we're not like, okay, here's our values, excellence, uh, family, or it, we don't just come up with words. They have to be very pulled from who you are as an individual. We share them, we do this exercise to bring everybody together. But then I work with the leadership and I say, what do these values look like at work? Demonstrate. What do they look like? What, and, and literally, what do they look like on a one-to-one -one level? What do they look like on a one-to-group level? What does it look like on a leader to, to uh, like employee to manager level and, and, and manager to employee level? What does it look like from the C-suite down? What is it? And we get this multidimensional view of what these values look like. And we come up with like 10 to 20 behaviors, specific behaviors of what you do in this situation to live out that value. Then we come out with 10 to 20 behaviors, specific behaviors that show the exact opposite of that value, the shadow of that value. And so from there, all of a sudden you have a clear understanding of not just like be excellent, but it's no, be excellent means that better is possible, good is not enough, right? And if I have something that needs to be done, I'm willing to ask for help from my partner to get it done by the deadline. And my partner will be willing to show that help at that time to get it done by the deadline because it's not about, oh, that's not my role. It's about our role is to achieve the goals. Then all of a sudden excellence comes out all of a sudden we get a clear understanding of demonstration. And of course it has to start at the top. There has to be buy-in from the top. But at the end of the day, man, what you're saying is the absolute truth. It is through demonstration. It is through action. It is through how you show up that determines what your reputation is. I can say everything, but people are gonna watch my actions. You want a perfect example of that? Look at kids. Kids will hear everything you tell them about life, but they're gonna pick up everything that you do. It's the same for all of us. If you want to be a leader, if you want to have a reputation, if you want to have that ability to affect people and, and provide resources, influence, and have that version of power, you better demonstrate it. Yeah, that's key. Otherwise, you'll have no credibility. No one's really going to follow you. It's like, you know, you think you're a leader. Look behind you. If there's nobody following you, it's called a long right, walk. Right. <laughs> it's just kind of like everybody's a life coach. You know what I mean? Everybody's a real estate agent. Everybody, right. like, you know what I mean? Everybody's a startup. When I was in the Bay, man, everybody had a startup. Oh, yeah, I'm a founder of a startup. I'm like, how many people? You know? <laughs> so right. you can give yourself whatever title you want. It's who's following, who believes in your vision. Yeah. I got to start up. How much funding have you, have you raised? Zero. I mean, right. Zero. Right. <laughs> so the last uh, law, the sixth law of power that I came across, this is really important too, is really infection, avoid the unhappy and unlucky. And that sounds harsh, but let's think mm. about this a second. Let's think about the impact of people in our lives that are negative. You got this vision, right. this goal, this dream. You're trying to maybe go to Mars like Elon Musk or do something massively incredible in your life. It requires very positive emotional energy because one thing will happen for certain, we, we, could, we could bank on it, we could predict it, is the plan won't go according to plan. There will be setbacks right. in any endeavor you right. go across. And, and sometimes I think we come across people with rose-colored glasses, right? And the reason we have rose-colored glasses is we don't wanna deal with some of the harsher issues of a relationship. 
We don't want to deal with some of the red flags that are very obvious in a relationship or in a business relationship or a situation. And so we'll tolerate and we'll put up with stuff. But I would argue that one of the key laws to power is you avoid these people. Unless you're a psychologist that's trained to deal with certain types of misery or certain types of behavior on your own, if you're not, you know, you're not trained classically, um, it's, it's not going to turn out so well. And I would say you can die from someone else's misery. We've seen people and you've known people, I've known people. It's like, man, they were this person, then they got with this person and they totally shifted. They totally right. changed. They got negative. They got morose. They got, you know, whatever. They just weren't the same person. We know that emotional states are as infectious as diseases. We were talking about COVID-19. Well, guess what? You get around somebody who's now sucked you in, got some emotional anchors in your life. There's this dependency that's created. And now they're showing up at a not high level, right? And they're right. just pulling you right down. Meanwhile, you have this bold, audacious goal. And then you what? Hit the wall, right? Because the person you're with is like, it, it's like the mob when they used to kill people, right? what they do? They put your, your feet in what? Concrete, right? Mm -hmm. Right. <laughs> so right, right, right. we're going to put your feet in concrete. Drop the bottom of the ocean. Yeah. And we're going to just push you off in the water and see if you can swim. Right, right. Yeah. You're not swimming very fast. Yeah. It's true, man. I feel like it's, it's, you know, it sounds harsh. Just like you said, it sounds harsh. Um, but one of the things that I say to my clients all the time, and it's such a weird, it's weird for them to hear it. And it's weird for me to say it because it's obvious, but it's not obvious. And it's, you deserve to feel better. You deserve to feel peace. You deserve to feel good. And I think that people don't really believe that. That's what's so hard. And, and a lot of times what happens is, you know, we have this savior mentality of wanting to save or change a person. But ultimately, I deserve to create the impact on this planet that I intend to. And I know that I need to feel and believe and be in a certain energy in order to do that. And I know that I need to feel and be surrounded by that energy with others in order to achieve that. This doesn't mean neglecting people that we care about, but you have to have the discernment to know the line between where you're trying to help somebody and where the codependency shows up, where the person needs a helper and you need someone to help. When it becomes there, then all of a sudden you are caught up in the relationship and you were actually being fed off of being able to help somebody, right? But what happens is that takes you off your journey, takes you off your path. And this is why discernment is so important. This is why knowing your mission, your vision, and your values at a very fundamental embodied level is extremely important. So you can be able to distinguish the difference between helping a friend and being caught up in their web. And it's also your webbage as well. It's your story tied up to their story that helps create this unhealthy symbiotic relationship, right? At the end of the day, if a person is not benefiting your efforts to evolve, you have to move on. And you don't move on by saying, cut, you're out, no, this is done. What you do is you continue your pace. You continue your pace. If I'm on a train and I'm moving at a very specific pace, I'm not going to stop the train. I'm going to give the person avenues in which they can hop on the train. But if they are not willing to catch up to the train, then the train has to keep going. With enough time, if I'm moving at this speed and you're moving at that speed, there all of a sudden becomes a separation. And the separation is not something that you're doing on purpose. It's not this offensive goodbye. It's I have to keep going. I have to keep going. It's just what it is because I'm tied to what I'm trying to create. And so the question for people who think that that's harsh, then, the, 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 then what you have to ask yourself is if that's harsh, maybe your job is to tend to that flock. Maybe your job is to stay there. But you have to ask this question as well. Do I find comfort in helping people who are less fortunate than me as a, as a guise to stop myself from evolving myself? Right. Because what kind of impact can you make at that higher level? Yeah. Now, I'm not saying I'm waiting till I achieve this high level to be person in the impact. But what I do is I work with people that are near my sphere, right? If they're near my sphere, then they're continuing to evolve and grow and change and they have the growth mindset. But if they're in a fixed mindset, I'm not going to allow that concrete to stop me from achieving because every minute I spend with the person, I'm feeding their narrative. This is how they get close to me. This is how the relationship works. And every minute that I'm with them, I'm taking away from minutes that I can exponentially impact the world. So what I have to do is I have to keep my pace. And if they can't keep up, I send love, I send blessings, but I must keep going. And then when I'm able to have the resources to do it at a higher exponential level, then I can send out more to help those people who work with that level.
that's just kind of the way that I, that I imagine it. I just don't think that it's healthy to allow yourself to get caught up, stuck in a relationship or in a group of relationships of people, no matter how long that you've been friends with them. I don't care if you grew up with them. I don't care if you just met them in college. With you, you don't want to stay with a relationship that stops you from spreading your wings and flying. You have to fly. And if they don't want to fly with you, they're a weathered friend. Yeah. Well, you know, what you said is really powerful. The whole idea, the the, the imagery of the trains, right? You got a certain speed. And the trick is when people come across people that fill a need, it's easy to pump the brakes on the train and then start to slow down with this person. And then you get to a certain point where you're like, who am I? What happened? I'm not happy. I'm miserable. And you weren't true to yourself or your journey or your mission, right? Um, Super, super important. As I was was thinking about, you know, you may think you're helping the drowning man, but you're only precipitating your own demise or your, your own disasters. So Again, I go back to if you have the wherewithal emotionally, mentally, financially, whatever, to help those people, absolutely help them. I'm all about that. But if you don't, you don't have the moral fortitude or the strength of character or whatever you want to call it to go into that person's life in a quality way and make an impact versus them making a negative impact in your life, you certainly have to look at that because ultimately you're going to wake up one day if you didn't see it clearly and you know, you're going to be 40, 50 saying shoulda, woulda, coulda. And that's what you right. want to avoid. Or even 67, you could say should have, would have, could have. I think it's really important to have that clarity, like you said, because um, I, I think these people will draw you into their misfortune, right? I, I've always said, you know, um, I always tell people, hey, you know, the thing about fishing is what the fish looks at is that hot, sexy bait, man. It's looking dope, right? right? right. It's looking dope. And what's the fish not really looking at? The hook right behind it. Mm. So just like everything in life, you got to look at the hook behind the bait because there's always a hook. And you got to walk in in wisdom and insight um, because as you're making these moves in lives, boy, it can bring tremendous pain to your journey, an otherwise bright journey. And I know a lot of people in mid-level career, or maybe a little beyond that, that have hit that wall and they've given up. Why? Because they didn't have the right strategies, the right insight. They didn't plan, do, act, check. They didn't revise their strategy. They got sucked into a relationship because they want to be nice guy, nice girl, whatever. Uh, To your point, it filled the need, right? It filled the void. Um, and I would say in the end, I would say it's real simple that you got to recognize it's like when you're flying a plane, we talked about this before is your attitude gets a certain criticality based on your airspeed, the wings will lose yeah. lift and it'll stall. If you don't recognize the stall, guess what happens if you don't exactly. recover? Depends on the altitude. It's going to be a bad outcome. And so in life, we've got to look at those stalls and relationships where it's not le- allowing us to move at the, v- at the velocity and the right. extent that we want to, we want to move at that God's called us to move at. Uh, or all or whatever you believe in. So I think ultimately it's as simple as it sounds. You got to really associate yourself with happy, the happy and the fortunate, the, the people that are grateful. Because when you do that, I would argue that it feeds your energy to go back and help those people in, in context, right? Once you have the emotional energy and the fortitude, and you've worked that muscle, then you can go back right. to help those people in quality way. Because what you don't want to do is help those people by going where they're at, right? And, and doing the same things yeah. where they're kind of stuck at. That's, that's not very. That helpful. is that's one hundred percent, man. I love that. It's really true. You have to put. You have to fill up your tank, right? You have to fill up your tank because you know if you're if you're not able to to exist and create and do your best and you're in that relationship, it's just it's sucking. It's it's a vampire. You know what I mean? You have to be able to surround yourself with those people, and it's. I can't tell you how important it is to have an environment of positive, grateful, uh, uh, active hustlers. In your court, when there, when you have that, the energy is compounding, and it moves you that much closer because you're seeing what they're doing. And oh, they're did it. This bad thing happened, but they flipped it to a positive. They see a silver line. All of a sudden, you create this massive energy that catapults you to greatness. You pick that up and you put that into a circle of negativity. It catapults you too, but to hell, like <laughs> it pull, it just as quickly sucks you away. Yeah. You know what I mean? That's the danger. You know, it reminds me of you know lifeguards. When a lifeguard's out saving a life, sometimes the person who's drowning is dangerous because they're flailing and they can actually drown both of you. You actually have to sometimes do a knockout punch on onto the uh, drowner so that they can relax so that you can bring them safely back in the sea. Sometimes you need to have conversations with these friends, these knockout conversations, and be like, I love you, but I have somewhere that I have to go to. And I just, and you really, I've had these conversations where I'm just like, hey, I really appreciate our relationship, but I can't just joke around about A, B, and C. That can't be the rest of my life. And if they take offense to it, then that tells me what type of friend they are. That's just simple as that. Is it that they like me as in this version of me, or is it they like me? Because if they like me, they'll like all versions of me. 
right? Yeah. If I get mad at a seed for becoming a plant and then a plant all of a sudden deceiving me and becoming a tree, then what type, this is not a, this is not a healthy relationship. We have to understand there's an evolutionary process that comes. And so a true friend accepts the evolutionary process. And so if they're not willing to move with me or at least ex allow me to be more distant because I need to be around, you know, fly with my eagles, then that's not a friend. That's just a tool. I'm just a tool to the person. At that point, it makes it real easy to keep the pace going. You know what I mean? Yeah. So that understanding is extremely important. Just like you said, you have to know where you're at to make sure that you make the right decisions so that you can fly. Yeah. And you know, misery loves company. You'll know right away, you know, if, if they're trying to pull you down or keep you at a certain level because they don't want you to be successful. There's jealousy. There's a lot of things. That's why right. it's so important to have that spidey sense and have that you know, I call it 360 dimensional view of things. And you're always checking in and you're looking at it from different angles. And it's not about, you know, proverbially shooting somebody in the head in your life, but it's about being wise about how that person right. affects you. I kind of look at the analogy like this. When I look at relationships, it's like a bank account, right? Um, there's debits and credits. If I put right. a lot of credits into a relationship, it's going to grow. It's going to thrive. If I have relationships taking a lot of debits, I have a massive negative red balance. Mm. I should look at that, right? Because all it's doing is sucking and, and it's drawing you down. And um, it's like you said, it's like the, the vampire effect. But it, to me, it's always been about the balance. And if you have a balanced relationship as you, as you achieve your, your, on, your, on your spectrum right, of, of development right. and you, you grow, as long as those relationships are maintaining balance uh, to the higher heights you want to go, cool. If not, um, it's you know, f fish or cut bait, man. Because ultimately, right. if you stay at this level to appease this person and you know you could have gotten here, um, you're not going to be a happy person in life. I would argue. I, I agree 100%, man. It's so, it's so important. And that's why I feel like at the end of the day, it's just so important to know what you're about. Because if you don't know what you're about, they say, if you won't stand for anything, you'll fall for everything. Right. And if you don't know who or what you are, then it becomes very difficult to, to, to understand or distinguish a person that wants you or wants the idea of you or a person that follows you because you're going to help them be successful. Like, I've had people that just kind of hang on your coattails. They're just like, just chilling there waiting for you to be successful because they don't want to do the work. I've had all this stuff and it's, it's just so important to know who you are because when you know who you are, you can make decisions. You're just like, is this an alignment? Is it not? Does it feel weird? All of a sudden you can really trust your emotions because they're not going to be these crazy things that pop in and out. It's no, there's an energy that I feel with this relationship that is pulling me away, that is not pushing me forward, that is keeping me neutral, like almost like it wants to keep you neutral because it's afraid of losing you. And then you're like, eh, this is not, this right. is not what I want to spend the rest of my life with, whether it's a business or a relationship or a friendship, you know what I mean? So I think that that personal awareness is what makes it easy to, 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 to make the decisions of who you want to surround yourself with. It makes it easy to understand when to keep things close to your chest and when to share it with the world. It makes it easy to understand when to argue or debate and then when to just shut up and find a way to influence the crowd to, to believe and see what you see. Like that awareness only comes with knowing who you are. And I think yeah. at the end of the day, all this power stuff that we're talking about, it really does dwindle down to do you know yourself? Do you know what you're here to do? Because at that point, you'll know what you have to do. That's a good point. You know, I think it's also about a guiding philosophy. I think about Jesus Christ's his mm -hmm. journey here on earth and his overarching message in my mind was about excellence, living your life with excellence, right? Excellence of purpose, excellence of character, yeah. right? Um, and that's that sort of uh, juxtaposed against average. And so we can have this continuum in life where we can pursue the average or the excellence. And I think the mm -hmm. trick is when you meet people across your path, and this is why there's a you know, closing on 60% divorce rate, people grow apart, right? Because you have that right. dynamic. One wants to drag and one wants to pull. And I think the trick is what you said is key is you've got to know who you are. You've got to know where you're going. Because if you don't, you're going to get to a point in your life where you want to go here. The person you're with is, is not there. And you're going right. to have that dynamic tension. And it's not going to work out. So it's about being so clear in who you are that whoever you bring in, especially in a relational sense, you're going to have kids with, you better be clear that they're going to be complementary and vice versa. Um, right. Because that drag shoot, that drug shoot um, really disrupts a lot of people's lives. And it's it, not that they're bad yes. people. They get themselves in situations because when they were 20, 30, they didn't do the work of who am I? What's my purpose? Where do I want to go? What's meaningful? What's valuable to me? And if I'm not clear on that, you get to a certain point where you're going to make some choices that you're really going to regret that have tremendous impact on your life. It's so, it's so real, man. And I guess, I guess we can say the first rule of power is to to know yourself because at that point you can wield your decisions, your choices, your perspectives 
with such clarity. And, and, you know, before you can, you know, control an army, you have to control yourself. Right. Right. And so in the same way, I think that, you know, we always end up coming back to the individual, but if I can have influence over my own self, if my own future self can have influences over my present actions, you know, my past self can teach me lessons so that I can uh, have an influence over building up my future self, then all of a sudden I've created this power base of resource and intelligence and clarity that allow me to have the confidence to lead other people. Right. Which takes one thing, right? Personal responsibility, accountability. It's right. Like, I was, Absolutely. I was reaching this it always comes back Navy down to that, man. <laughs> and there's not enough of that going on in, in America. That is Navy SEAL book yeah. like talking about personal accountability and ownership and, and, yep. and taking stock and, and being fully aware of what your part of it is. So, uh, Absolutely. Six, six Laws of Power. Burke, enjoyed it. Enjoy the conversation. Dude, Ben, as always, man, this was great. Good to be back here. Good to chat about this. Yeah. Till next time. Thanks, Burke. All right, buddy.